So the purpose of tonight's presentation is to uh, talk to you about the opportunity that's available in One Call Capital, which is a fund that has uh, recently launched. And the spirit and the thesis behind what we're doing here is that we're offering uh, passive investors a consistent return uh, in a market that is uh, certainly feels uncertain. And so we've uh, found an opportunity for alpha in the marketplace. And so we're going to walk everybody through our business processes and the kind of loans that we do. And this is an opportunity for you guys to basically buy into a financing company that funds real estate investors in their business. Go ahead and pull out your phones and grab this uh, a QR code so that you can grab a time on my calendar so that we can talk shop after we get done here. So typical disclaimer, this is not an offer to sell. Um, if you are interested, we'll we'll talk and then I'll actually provide you um, a private offering memorandum. But at this point, this is just a high level presentation that's for informational purposes only. And this is a, a Reg D 506C fund that's intended for accredited investors. So just in, in principle, what is a fund? You hear people talk about a fund uh, quite a bit uh, in the market, and I'm not sure everybody uh, really entirely knows what, what that is. I certainly didn't until recently. And so uh, a fund is a way to pool resources together in order to do an investment. And there are typically two types of members of a fund. One is called the general partners, typically called the fund manager or the operator, the sponsor, which are kind of uh, synonymous terms. So you'll hear me kind of use those interchangeably, but uh, the GP general partners are the ones that manage the fund. And then the capital investors are the limited partners who are the passive investors in the fund. And so in this case, we're looking, we're seeking an investment in uh, our fund, One Call Capital. And some of you may be interested in uh, deploying some of your available capital and getting a high rate of return while minimizing risk. And so the, our thesis is that's what we can offer to you. And here I'll talk about the mechanics of it. So capital investors contribute to the fund. They put in, say, $100,000 for their contribution into the fund. And then the GP, me and my team, we run the business of making investments. And we'll talk a minute about what what the, the, the details of what those investments are. Um, but once the investments uh, return, uh, um, in our case, interest, uh, those, those returns are sent back to the limited partners. And then from there, the limited partners and the, and the general partners split. And there's a kind of a waterfall that we'll show you on how the, the, the profits of the fund are split between the LPs and the GPs. <clears throat> and so this is the team. I'm the uh, founder and CEO, and I'll have Brad introduce himself here in a minute. Uh, if you haven't met me before, I've been a real estate investor for several years. I used single family investing as a way to escape my day job in corporate America. I've raised lots of capital, I've done lots of deals. I host a podcast, I uh, have a, a um, YouTube channel and all the socials uh, all, along with it. Um, and we even do a newsletter. So we put out a fair amount of content about real estate investing. And the latest uh, adventure that I'm on is being a, a fund manager. And I recently uh, brought on Kyle and Brad as part of the team. Kyle is a former military officer. Uh, he's a member of a, or a director of a, of a bank, um, or he's on the board of directors of a bank. And he has lots of uh, real estate experience himself. And he basically runs the back office for us. And then I'll jump over Brad for a second and jump to Valerie. She's our bookkeeper. She keeps us all squared away. And then Brad is our chief underwriter, and I'll give him the floor for a few minutes. Hey, Brad DeGraw. And yeah, like Paul said, usually I wouldn't be on this side. I, I really just focus on the deals. So all day, every day, I spend my time just evaluating deals and just separating kind of tranches of risk. And that's my jam. And he's very good at it. So a little bit of a kind of the mechanics of this. So uh, borrowers come to uh, One Call Capital looking for loans in our particular niche, which we'll dig into a little more here in a second. And uh, Brad is the first point of contact from the borrowers, whereas I'm the first point of contact for uh, the capital investors. And so on the back end, we have a, we have processes that do our underwriting, kind of review it, and then I serve as the kind of the the last line of defense, and I basically say go or no go, 
on if, if a loan gets funded or not. So we have uh, multiple parties and it's in, intentionally designed that it takes two out of three of us to make any decision. So if any of us are on vacation or we get hurt or something, then the other two can still run the business. So let's we'll talk about the background of the fund and kind of how we got to this idea of starting a fund in the first place. So I started investing in single family rentals as a way to uh, get out of my day job. And in that process of learning how to be a real estate investor, I also learned how to uh, issue loans out of my solo 401k, my self-directed IRA, and then of course, some of my taxable accounts as well. And as I did that business, I found that uh, my available capital got tapped out before long. And so I started raising private funds to do uh, deals on my own and doing um, raising private funds to uh, do individual loans on uh, projects that I came across. And then uh, I decided to formalize uh, a, a lending company and I brought some team members on and I took on some investors who actually invested in a small company. Several of us put in like 10, 20, $40,000 and we created a, a small seed capital type uh, lending business. We had about 300 K to work with. So we were very small, uh, but we were able to do turn our money uh, quite a few times in, in, in a year's time. And I did that for two years. And that was my proof of concept that I wanted to be in the lending business. And I really liked that sort of business. And so that kind of led to me creating a formal fund called One Call Capital, and it's based primarily on lending to real estate investors on short-term um, asset-based loans. And so the fundamental that we're looking to solve with One Call Capital is in the current market cycle, there's a lot of economic uncertainty if you're an investor. If you have capital to deploy, you're kind of wondering where you can get the highest yield, but also minimize the risk. Uh, the public markets are extremely volatile. Crypto is certainly volatile. And you're just not really sure where to put your money because if you sit, let it sit still, it's losing to inflation. And so uh, we basically are um, uh, identify the problem that, you know, what does a, a capital investor do in this uncertain market? And then the uh, flip side, from a borrower's point of view, a lot of operators, investors right now can come across some good real estate deals, but they can find them at quite good discounts, in fact, but they need uh, access to cash, quick cash to be able to secure those projects. And oftentimes traditional banks, especially in our asset class, are interested, the, the loans are too small, and they just don't typically are interested in raw land, which is what we tend to focus on. So our solution is that we basically connect capital that is looking for a high yield with low, uh, uh, low risk and match that to uh, deals that need cash to secure a really good discount. And so we provide asset-based loans to real estate investors and we pool our funds together into a fund. And that gives us the ability to be very quick and nimble and able to um, empower our borrowers to get a, get a hold of deals very quickly. And so we fund no more than 50% loan to value, but in our particular asset classes or our particular asset class, oftentimes the borrowers are buying the property for well below 50% of its value. And we'll talk about that in some of our use cases here in a minute. And then we charge uh, quite high interest rates for the liquidity that we, we access to it. And then we share those profits with our investors. And then we use those, that physical real property as, as collateral against the loan. And so compare this option to what is available in the marketplace. So to be very conservative and safe, you could put your money into an annuity, a CD or a bond. And we all know this is very low returns and it's predictable, but it's probably losing to inflation. You're not going to be growing your capital very well by doing that. On the other hand, you can put your money into the public markets in Wall Street, like index funds or ETFs. And that market we know is also very volatile. And you certainly can win at that game, but it's a very long time horizon. And you have to make sure you don't get wrapped up into the irrational exuberance or the, or the irrationality of the marketplace and sell at the wrong time. So spending time in the market over 20 years is probably a good strategy, uh, but sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down. And if you need to sell while you're down, then you've lost all your gains for the last 15, 10, 10, 15, 20 years. Or the other option is you could be an active real estate investor and actually do deals yourself, which is certainly a, a valid a method. Many of us on here are active real estate investors, including me and Brad, but we are, have to spend a lot of our time actively running a business. 
managing tenants and toilets or dealing with whatever headaches go along with the current kind of asset class that you're invested in, insurance, taxes, legal fees, et cetera. And so let's talk about this kind of at a, at a, at a uh, one sheet of music, so to speak. So on the far right is the idea of doing funds or syndications. And then on the far left is this idea of using um, very conservative, safe investments, being annuities, CDs, and bonds. If you go across the, the range here, uh, it's kind of ordered in the, the level of returns. So annuities, CD, and bonds are typically you know single digit, low single digits, uh, but 100% passive. The, the stock market or index funds uh, can, depending on who who you believe and who you read, you can get somewhere between seven and 10, 12, 11%, depending on, on who, you know, kind of what range of the market you're talking about, what timeline you're, you're looking back historically. And this is, of course, based on the performance of the U.S. economy. Um, and this is also extremely volatile. But I think a lot of people agree that if you invest in, in the stock market over the long term and you um don't sell on whims, you can come out ahead with somewhere between seven to eleven percent return. Um, and then an active real estate investor, uh, there's a lot of data points on what people people tend tend to earn, and it's uh, on average twelve percent. And of course, this is again not passive. This is where you're having to uh, bring your knowledge and, and wherewithal to bear and run and run a, a small business. Whereas the fund and syndication model is where you buy into a small business, like what we're doing at One Call Capital, and returns can be somewhere between 12 and 17% in the marketplace. And this is intended to be 100% passive. So our investment thesis, simply stated, is like in a market when you have rising interest rates and uh, we can use asset-based uh, loans to offer a consistent, stable return, risk-adjusted return with high rates of return. And so basically we want to take the least amount of risk to get the highest possible reward, also it being secured by a real property. That's the investment thesis at One Call Capital. And so let's talk about the types of loans that we do within our, our fund. We're very specific. We're a very specific niche. So we do short-term loans that are six months or less. And oftentimes the uh, loan amounts are typically uh, $100,000 or less. And so we offer uh, short-term loans to land flippers who can buy a property at well below the market rate, charge them a fairly high interest rate for doing so, and then uh, uh, allow them to actually get a hold of that, that, that property, do their flip within six months or less. And then another uh, um, discipline that we're getting into quite a bit more is what they call transactional lending. And if you haven't heard of this before, this is where somebody has access to a deal from a seller, we call them the A party, and you are the B, the, the, the investor is the B uh, buyer, and they have a C in buyer in mind. And so they get the A to B contract tied up, they get the B to C contract set up, but they don't have the cash to actually close the transaction. And so transactional lenders can come in and basically fund the, the whole transaction. And it tends to be a very short uh, three day, 72 hours or less situation. And of course, by offering the liquidity, we get a fee for it. And again, we're doing this at a very high scale or high volume of loans with very lo low loan amount. And then also each loan is secured by a piece of property that is either has a seller contract already uh, um, at the title company or is a uh, two times collateral, meaning no more than 50% loan to value. And so here's our internal process. So a, a deal comes in, uh, a, a borrower comes to Brad and says, hey, we have a particular deal. Uh, Brad does the underwriting and then he sees if that meets our loan criteria. And we say no as often as we say yes, you're just not, you just don't meet our bullseye. We're very specific. And then when someone does pass the underwriting process, uh, we think of ourselves as a partner with them and we establish kind of a repeat business scenario and we use the, the their real property that they have on contract as a uh, collateral against the property. And so we you know do the typical uh, land title search. We get a title commitment from a closing agent. We always run everything through a closing agent or a closing attorney. And then our terms are no more than 50% loan to value. And then once we confirm all those things are taken care of, all the um, uh, check marks qualify, then we fund these qualified deals. And then the operators go and do their thing. They go and flip the land. They go and do the transaction. Uh, whatever their exit strategy is, they go and execute. 
And at the closing of a loan, uh, we have a security instrument, a mortgage or deed of trust, depending on what state we're in, and then a promissory note, which clarifies or details what the the loan details are. And the and again, we're always using collateral, and the mortgage or deed of trust is the piece of paper that actually uh, attaches that uh, promissory note to the collateral or to the property as collateral. And then as they're doing their deal, our interest is, is accruing and then uh, interest payments are made and the payouts are made to investors on a quarterly basis. And we hold quarterly calls with every borrower. And if they're not performing, we again, we tend to do very short term loans. If they haven't moved their transaction within a quarter, we're having a conversation with them to see if they're on pace and if they're making sense, because we have an obligation to pay out our capital partners on a quarterly basis. Um, and then once this is all said and done, uh, the transaction is complete. We repeat the process one through three, uh, very much focusing on repeat borrowers. And we do seek out new borrowers, but we're just very selective. Once they have good credibility and capability, then they become our new partners. And of course, we have a, a chief operating officer in Kyle who is always looking at the internal operations to see if we can make anything smoother or uh, easier to manage. So here are the terms of the One Call Capital Fund. And this is a, uh, our, the, the name of the company is One Call Capital. The limited partnership name is called One Call Capital Fund LP. So partners, uh, limited partners are investing into shares of the One Call Capital Fund. And then the partnership size is up to $10 million. Minimum commitment for accredited investors is 100 k uh, There's a one-year commitment period, which is fairly short for funds. Oftentimes, it's much longer than this. So our idea is we're turning the money uh, in six months or less, often three months, and we're paying you out on a quarterly basis. And at the end of one year, you can get your principal back, or you can decide to kind of recast the, the investment. And so the target annual return is 15% and the offering period closes at the, once we raise $10 million, then the fund closes. And the management fee that we're charging in the first year is 0% and the preferred return is 12%, meaning that uh, one call capital and our partners do not, or the, the general partners do not get paid uh, anything until the limited partners earn a 12% return first. So all profits go to the, limited partners first until they get a 12% return. And then the, the the general partners and the limited partners share the uh, the profits 50-50. So I can't restate this enough that we don't get paid until you earn your 12% and we do not charge a management fee. Many funds do charge a management fee. So what are we doing to manage the risk? Anytime you're investing your capital, you want to make sure you what you know, figure out what your return is going to be and how do you uh, protect your principal. So you know, the, the first rule of, of investing is don't lose your money, right? Um, so risk reduction is we do short-term loans six months or less. And then on average, I believe we actually do like our average turns out to be three months, but our, our terms are written to be six months or less. Uh, we do a very low loan to value ratio of only 50%. And that means that we can... Uh, it gives us room for error. We, we don't try and allow for error, but this gives us room for if there's a market correction or things aren't selling right or we misvalue the comps, that we have a lot of room for error there. And then we do very small loans. So your investment is spread out over many small loans versus one big loan that if it were to go bad, then you're basically attached to the outcome of that one loan. And again, all of our loans are secured by a secure security instrument against real property. And then we love to work with repeat borrowers. In this span, this space of transactional lending and land flipping, it's a very small space. And it turns out that um, it, it, their reputation is extremely important to these land flippers. And so just working with experienced repeat borrowers is just a win-win scenario all the way around. So then I'll pass it over to Brad to talk about a case study. Let's dive into some case studies. Like I said, this is more my side of things where all day, every day, I look at deals and it's really a matter of risk. Risk is our number one concern. That's our priority. The most we can do to mitigate the risk makes it more appealing to us. So here's a good example. Um, this is an actual deal in Fulton County, which is um, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Small loan, 18500 A lot of our loans, they're small. And that's why this niche is so profitable because it's overlooked by other potential providers of capital. 
Um, no banks, credit unions, they just really don't service this size of, of product. And so that's why this works. So this was a small $18,000, $500 loan. Um, it turned around and you can see on the screen, the payout was 21,500, a healthy, healthy return. And if you look at the little graphic there, that's what we call an infill lot. So if you go through a residential neighborhood, it's house, 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 vacant lot, house, house, house. That is an infill lot. Everyone has, you know, mail and recycling. It's a desirable place to live. There's just no house there. So it's great collateral for us. Um, here's a good one. Now, these are my favorites. We call these transactional funding. And Paul went over briefly, but this is just kind of a little deeper dive. So when our clients have a deal tied up, they're in their option period where they have the right to purchase, but not the obligation to purchase. Um, they can get the property under contract for a fixed amount. In this case, 58,000. I'm sorry. Um, yes, yes 58,000. And the loan was 50,000. So there's $8,000 worth of fees that the client took care of. That was their portion. And then there's the B to C. They, they went out and found a retail buyer, someone who's willing to pay a higher price for it for $78,000. Now, different states have different criteria and even different title companies within the states will uh, prefer to do their transactions differently. But needless to say, they're able to do both transactions on the same day in a series, but they're not allowed to do what's called a pass-through, taking the B to C money, that $78,000, to cover that first transaction of $58,000. And that's, that's our little niche. That's where we fit in. And they pay a nice premium for it. And most of the risk is mitigated because there's almost nothing that can go wrong. And anything that could go wrong would be mitigated by not releasing the funds for the transaction. So signatures, money, closing of the deal. Let's go and we have one more and then I'll pass it right back over to Paul. Um, so another, my thing is raw land. I like two-dimensional real estate. If you notice the trend here, there's no structure. There's no building, there's no home, just two-dimensional real estate. Um, here's just a snapshot of a payoff statement. Um, they accrued 8700 8750 in interest, plus what we call an underwriting fee or an admin fee for $1,000. Um, the loan amount was $75,000. When you add it all up, their payoff was $84,750. And not every deal closes on time. It's actually fairly common for some sort of delay, which is not a bad thing. It just means maybe all the signatures didn't show up or all the money didn't show up something happened to delay it. And you can see the per diem rate is even listed there. So long story short, the collateral is five acres. The loan was $75,000. It was a pretty quick two month turnaround and it just works. And we do these all day, every day. So here's our track record and we're doing this. Uh, so since inception, we've done 58 loans. Um, we have done uh, $1.3 million in loans. Uh, since the inception date, um, our average loan size is just over 25 grand. Um, so, you know, I've, I've said before, our loan criteria is is basically 100,000 or less. And our, you see our average is well, well below that. Um, we've done this, I think, now in 16 states. And our default rate so far is uh, 0%, meaning we have had nobody default. Uh, outside of the fund, I've had one de default happen before because a borrower passed away. And so I have had to go through the foreclosure process and the the mechanics and the fees associated with that. So I'm familiar with the process. And so we're always doing everything we can to avoid that. But it's pretty common in our, our business that a 1% default rate is what you're going to expect because of just life happens. And occasionally there's going to be um, somebody who just simply physically cannot uh, execute on the loan because of health reasons or um, sometimes legal reasons and uh, sometimes just uh, something tragic like, like passing away. Um, and so our uh, typical loan duration so far has been uh, three months. And so this is the important part for all of you to notice is the our average return inside the fund is 18%. And so remember, the preferred return is 12%. So 
all the profit of that 18 goes to the limited partners first, the 12%. And then the general partners and the limited partners split the difference 50-50. So the LP's returns are, in this case, are 15%. And the general partners earn 3% of for managing the fund. So here's some testimonials. Um, actually, I believe, um, Todd, you know Casey. Um, Casey's a friend of mine who is a firefighter here in Little Rock where I live. And he also runs an Amazon fulfillment business in on, on the side, and he does quite well with that. So he has some extra capital. And so he invested with us, and this is um, his take on working with us because he's too busy to um, to be a full-time firefighter, have a, a FBA business, and be an active real estate investor. So he takes his available cash and invests in the fund to get his uh, 12 to 15% return without having to um, act actively manage that process himself. So Scott points out that the um, Arkansas property was A, B to C um, because it was a transactional loan. So it's a very interesting scenario, Scott, and it's a very astute observation. Um, on a A, B to C transaction, transactional funding, um, we will not send the fund to fund the A to B transaction until the C funds show up. So it's the lowest risk scenario you can you can possibly think of. So the funds are in the title company from the C buyer of $78,000. And then our, uh, our money of in this case, $50,000 shows up to fund the A to B. And we simply will not fund and will not allow them to release funds until the funds from the C shows up. So the, in that case, risk is mitigated. Our loan to value ratio of 50% is for uh, anything that doesn't have a contractual exit uh, scenario for a land flip. This is uh, another friend of mine, uh, Ryan, who is also a note investor and buyer himself. And so he runs an active business where he's buying and selling notes. And so he has money in his IRA that uh, he cannot get involved. He, he can self-direct, but he can't self-deal. So he wants an arm's length transaction in his IRA. So he's invested with us as well and getting the the, the returns that um, you know we've forecasted here so far. And that way he can spend his time um, working his business of being a note buyer while also having his money in his IRA working hard for him without him having to be involved in it all the time. So this this is a very good opportunity for people to invest as a um, in their IRA or solo 401k because um, it's it just it's it's kind of an optimal environment because you want that to be you, in fact that has to be a passive investment for you so uh, that is a, a good place to uh, store your your cash buy shares in our fund and then let the transactions happen without you being involved so you get the kind of returns that you would earn from an active business without having to be an active business okay so what questions do you have there've been some good ones so far go ahead and pull out your phones and grab this link so if you're interested or want to talk shop you can grab my time on my calendar. This, this is a link directly to my calendar. So we do have a portal, uh, Dan. So uh, investors in the fund have access to a portal and they can see, um, they get quarterly reports. And then at the end of the year, you get the, the K-1s. Question about personal yeah. guarantees. Um, yes. So the clients do sign a personal guarantee in most cases. There may be a rare uh, exception where maybe they're working deals through a tax advantage account. So that's not appropriate. But in 99% of the time, that's that's going to be true. They do sign a personal guarantee. Yeah. If they're using their IRA or something, they're not allowed to um, personally guarantee it. They have to be non-recourse loans if they're um, in an IRA. So this is kind of my side of things. So all day, every day, we look at deals and data. Land is kind of interesting because a lot of the land transactions don't go through MLS. A lot of them are direct uh, transactions. So there's a couple of different sources and every state's a little bit different. Some states, like my home state, Texas, they don't have, they're a non-disclosure state. So that transactional data is not generally available to the public. And that's where it makes sense to team up like with a realtor who can pull the transactional data um, also we look at the websites that do specialize in lands transactions. So you can get some data off like realtor.com. You can get data off like Zillow, 
but more likely Lands of America and specialty land websites like that will show you what's uh, sold and currently for sale. And we comp it out just like any other real estate. And we need to be conservative because if you're not able to see the boots on the ground, you really need to mitigate risk. So we take the most conservative data we can find. Todd asked, uh, I thought funds could be held for two years. Is it really one year? And you meant, as you mentioned here, for uh, one call capital, it, it is only required to commit for one year. Uh, that's on a per fund basis, Todd. So I don't, I'm not aware of any regulation that requires um, a fund to be held for two years. Some some funds do it that way. I always say it's more common than not for for funds to require a longer commitment period. But since we do such short term loans, we can afford to do. Uh, a short-term commitment because we're moving the money fast. I think the reason other funds would have a longer commitment period is if they were actually buying real property and they were holding and doing a value add on a multifamily or something. It's if suddenly an investor is wanting their money back in one year, they'd be in a, in a world of hurt real fast. So that's the reason I think other funds require it for longer. The The most common state for us is probably Florida. The reason for that is Florida is very generous with the data. So if our clients can get good data and it's easy for us to have good data, it just f- facilitates more transactions there. Also, developers have sliced up Florida pretty well over the, the last, let's say, 50, 60 years. Um, Texas, where I live, is big. Georgia, North Carolina, several states. But if we had to pick one state, it'd probably be Florida. Yeah. yeah that, uh, so Florida, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, so I think would be the order of Yep. priority right yeah scott had a a good question here okay. uh tax form at the end of the year yeah thankfully i've hired a, a, a external a third-party fund management company that they take care of all of that so everything is in the fund i've i've paid for their uh tax treatment services and you'll get the the uh the k1 form um at the because you're a partner in a uh in, in a company and so you'll get a k1 per year just like a syndication, if you've ever done one of those. All right. And I think that will uh, wrap us up. So I appreciate everybody's attention and great questions. And uh, please grab the link, grab the, um, the time on my calendar, and we can talk shop and get you going. Nice meeting all y'all. Bye-bye.